Before I introduce today's guest, I want to tell you about our sponsor of our podcast, uh, The Great Courses Plus. This is the teaching company, The Great Courses, which I've been listening to for decades. They have thousands of uh, professionally produced college courses or courses taught by college professors, the best in the country. And they, they've introduced an uh, app for your phone. It's thegreatcoursesplus.com. And uh, so you just t- touch the app and you open up the course you want to listen to. The one I just started this week is on uh, Understanding the Old Testament by Professor Robert D. Miller II. So um, just to give you an idea uh, of how it works, you just touch on the lecture you want to listen to. Like number one is the Old Testament is literature. Number two is the Genesis creation story. I'm right now on uh, chapter th- or lecture three, what God intended for Adam and Eve. Oh boy, this should be interesting. In any case, this is great because you can skip around. If I find one of the lectures boring, I just skip to the next one. Uh, you can do it on audio or video and all from your phone. It's, it's a terrific way to consume content, particularly during social isolation. During the pandemic, it's a great way to become an autodidact. So if you want to know more, you can, if you sign up through uh, my podcast, uh, then you get um, a free trial. So go to uh, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash salon. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash salon, and you get a free trial with uh, free access to the entire library of all these hundreds and hundreds of courses and thousands of lectures. So with that, I'll introduce my next guest. My guest today is Stuart Ritchie. His new book is called Science Fictions, subtitled How Fraud, Bias, Negligence, Hype, and Hype Undermine the Search for Truth. Stuart Ritchie is a faculty member at the Social, Genetic, and Developmental Psychiatry Center, King's College, London. He's a noted supporter of the Open Science Movement, which aims to reform scientific practice and help scientists become more transparent in their reporting their results. So we go through the big four categories of, uh, of the biggest problems of the replication crisis, that is fraud, bias, negligence, and hype. There's plenty of all of that. So we go through uh, specific examples of that. And then uh, we also talk about um, Matthew Walker's book on sleep and uh, how that's been uh, critically analyzed in terms of the uh, sometimes overly simple conclusions that he drew from that. But to his credit, he's responded to some of those. Uh, Amy Cutter's power posture TED Talk and and how that data was challenged. Uh, Andrew Wakefield's vaccines and autism, which was outright fraud. And, and that's probably the, the most destructive fraudulent science in history. Uh, we discuss the complications of determining the causality in correlational studies in diet and nutrition. As many of you know, I'm interested in that subject personally, but it is a it it is a important topic. Um, Phil Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment, which wasn't really an experiment, but what can we learn from that? As well as Stanley Milgram shock experiments, um, Steve Gould's analysis of uh, Morton's skulls that showed racial differences in skull size, therefore allegedly intellectual capability, and how that was then challenged, and how the the skeptics of Gould themselves uh, have skeptics. We talked about self-plagiarism, the file drawer problem, deter- detecting fraud um, in science, terror management theory, which is most of you know I'm pretty skeptical of, but uh, it, the larger issue there being uh, to what extent um, priming research really taps into unconscious motives inside people's heads. Very difficult to get into that. So with that, I give you Stuart Ritchie. Congratulations on the new book. Here, I listened to it on audio. Oh, Here we go. That. Science thanks. Fictions. How Fraud, Bias, Negligence, and Hype Undermine the Search for Truth. Great cover, by the way. I love that. <laughs> uh, I also thanks. like that uh, you know, my policy is book, cover, book titles or subtitles. One of the two should tell the reader what the book is about. So your subtitle perfectly <laughs> outlines the problem. There's fraud, there's bias, there's negligence, and there's hype mainly media hype, but, uh, but hype in general, uh, that's part of the problem. Yeah. So I thought I'd start today by, by saying, I, th- I think your book is, uh, really timely. I mean, it's super important that we clean house now and not just privately, like, let's just keep this matter 
you know, don't make this pub- book public because, you know, then the creationists are going to find out or the climate deniers are going to find out and they're going to go, you yeah, see? <laughs> but, you know, as long as go as the 1980s, when I first started writing about the creationist movement, uh, you know, because they used to point out creationists, you know, all the errors and mistakes and biases on the part of evolutionary biologists over over the last century, as if to say, you see, they uh, they can't get their story straight or they're wrong or they're biased. But Gould, Steve Gould would always point out, but it was the scientists who uncovered the fraud or the bias or the right. mistake, not the creationists. Creationists just sort of yeah. scrape through the journals to see if they can find errors that they can capitalize on. And that's sort of the point of your book is like, we, we need to do this ourselves. Agreed. And, you know, when was the last time you heard a, an article getting retracted from a creation science journal because of some error in it? That's just not that's just not uh, something right. that happens. Yeah. So um, anyway, then I, I thought I'd start off with, um, with with where you start with the Daryl Bem experiment. Of course, I'm familiar with your mm. attempt to replicate it as well as um, Richard, Fein, mm. uh, Richard Wiseman's attempt as well. Uh, you know, when mm-hmm. that study mm-hmm. came out, this was this is an interesting problem because. For you know, decades, scientists have been saying, "Well, the reason we're skeptical of ESP and psychic power and, and all that psi um, is because you you guys have no experimental evidence. There's no peer reviewed controlled study, you know. So of course, the the believers came out. All right, Shermer, <laughs> here it is. You know, and yeah. it's by Daryl Bem, a <laughs> famous no scientist, published in a respected yeah. journal. It was peer reviewed. It's statistically significant. Now, what do you say? And I'm yeah. like, oh, uh, <laughs> mm. <laughs> Yeah, it looks scary. It looks terrifying to a skeptic. Uh, it looks like it's a very legitimate thing. Um, yeah, but then of course, uh, I, I think I think regardless of whether it's regardless of whether that result is true or not, it illustrates so many problems with the scientific method um, and the scientific system. Not necessarily the method, but the system that we that we're in and the way that we publish papers. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we can go through all the problems with that paper because I can. Well, just, just <laughs> I can list them yeah, all. I'm, I'm, yeah, let's do that in just a second. But just to point that. Yeah. You know, even though we say we're waiting for a, a statistically significant peer reviewed study in a respectable journal, that that isn't really what is going to do it. You, you got to have multiple and replicated and a convergence of evidence from different labs that all find the same thing and so on. And and even that may not do it because I think you still ultimately need some kind of mechanism behind it. What would drive this process, say, if it's psychic powers in the neurons? And of course, you know, they they have ideas about, you know, quantum physics and consciousness somehow, you know, we link up our thoughts or something like that. But we don't even need that because the study itself didn't show what what it initially looked like. So let's just start there. What what was the problem with this study? Well, so uh, there were nine experiments in the study. So it was, it was a really long uh, paper with nine separate experiments. And, um, you know, so the, the first one was the kind of eye catching one that everyone everyone found amusing because it had. Uh, it had pornography in it, which is what got everyone really excited. So uh, the people, the participants were shown two uh, curtains on the screen and they had to click uh, one of them, whichever one they thought there was a picture behind. And they were like, well, I, I have no idea whether there's a picture behind. And they just said, you, know, just, you just have to guess. Um, and uh, uh, if you just put a really boring picture behind one of them, like a picture of a chair or something like that, then uh, they get it 50-50 percent of the time it's it's uh, just a random choice but if you put pornography behind one of the behind one of the, the curtains what daryl bem claimed in this paper was that you, uh, people clicked it i think 53.1 percent of the time so it was statistically significantly uh, more likely than chance to, to 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 click that that particular curtain and that was part of his argument that he uh, thought that it was a uh, um uh, that this was evidence for some kind of unconscious kind of psychic erotic desire that we have to like anticipate um, erotic stimuli. And um, so that was one of the experiments. Uh, there were several others. And the idea was that you basically take normal psychology experiments that people would ordinarily be doing in the lab and then flip the timing round. So the one on memory, which is the one that we tried to replicate, was um, normally in a psychology experiment, maybe you would you would uh, show people a list of words, then you would show them half those words again, and then give them a memory test. And uh, they would do better at remembering the words that they'd seen twice, right? I mean, that's just kind of obvious. But what he did with this really simple idea is he put the reminder after the test. So you'd see the words uh, for the first time, then you do the test, the memory test, you just have to write down as many of the words as you can. And then you're reminded of half the words again afterwards. Um, And what he claimed was that the people were uh, better at remembering on the test the words that they were about to see afterwards than than the ones uh, uh, that they'd only seen once. And so as I say in the book, it's like 
you study for an exam, then you sit the exam, and then you study again afterwards. <laughs> And that studying helps, like somehow goes back in time and helps you do better on tests. So this is like a mind blowing result, and it was actually quite a big result in terms of like the statistical effect size. It was actually quite a big, a big effect. So that's why we thought we would replicate that one, and we failed to replicate it. But um, I guess before we even get to that, the point is that um, there were lots of problems in the in the in the paper itself. Um, the paper, uh, you know, you look across all those nine experiments and there are lots of different sample sizes. Some of them have 50 participants, some of them have 100, some of them have 150. And it didn't look like it was planned beforehand. Um, and you see this quite a lot in scientific papers. It kind of implies that the the the, the, um, the, the scientist was kind of um, collecting participants as they, as they go along and maybe running the analysis, checking whether they got a, an interesting, significant result. If they didn't get a significant result, they'd add a few more participants in and just try it again. And then I'll oh, try another another few participants. A lot, of, a lot of scientists admit that that's exactly what they do in their day-to-day -day, uh, practice. Um, there were also issues with the statistical tests that were used. They were very, very kind of permissive statistical tests. Uh, they were very kind of lenient statistical tests. And I think you would want to be in, if you were testing the existence of psychic powers, you would probably want uh, to be quite conservative with your statistical test and only accept evidence to a really, really high standard. Um, so there were those kind of issues with the with the the, the study, um, which were pointed out at the time. And you know, this was this became part of a discussion about you know this is the kind of stuff that gets published in the in the literature. And then you know, obviously, it attracted a huge amount of attention because it was about psychic powers. But um, then we kind of thought, well, wait a minute, this is the standard way of publishing research. It's not that this is like abnormally bad psychology you know uh, psychology research it's not abnormally bad statistics or experimental design this is the norm this is what people are doing um in areas that are much less exciting than you know whether people can sense porn <laughs> right. uh, in the future um it's like you know it, th this is what people do in you know clinical psychology research uh, cognitive psychology research social psychology research um and so that kind of led to a wake-up call even without our attempt to replicate it which is a kind of a separate story and illustrates even more problems but even even just looking at the quality of this paper itself there were enough issues with um, with that, that that would make you make you worry a little bit about the quality of science that's getting into the top journals. Right. So this is not fraud or or bias. It's just more of a methodolo built in methodological problem with all of science, including as you noted at the beginning of your book that you your replication was declined by the same journal because they only want original stuff, not replications. That in itself yeah. is a problem. Yeah, we were told specifically by the editor that they wouldn't even consider sending our paper out for peer review, uh, which you know was our, that was our failed replication attempt because the journal, whether positive or negative, uh, is just not interested in replication attempts uh, uh, at all. I should say that since that happened, this was in about 2011, 12. Um, since that happened, that journal now, if you if you look at its website now, it has on its website we like uh, we would like to uh, consider replication studies. So something has changed. Um, I think that's still a rarity, um, but that particular journal, possibly because of this rather embarrassing uh, situation that that happened to them, uh, uh, you know, um, in 2012 ish, um, uh, and and in fact, you know, because of that and because of the publicity that came uh, around that, th that was one of the things that started off this whole discussion of the replication crisis in psychology research. That was one of the things that really kicked off this whole kind of. Um, period of sort of soul searching that psychology research has been going into. And of course, that that soul searching has kind of bled out into lots of other fields of research as well. So, you know, things that's that's one, you know, it was a depressing thing to happen. But actually, there has been some progress on, on in, in that particular journal. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I uh, closed my Scientific American column on the BEM study with a quote from, well, James, the psychologist James Alcock found in BEM's paper, writing the empirical journal article on his webpage in which oh, yes. Bem instructs students, quote, think of your data set as a jewel. Your task is to cut and polish it, to select the facets to highlight <laughs> and to craft the best setting for it. Many experienced authors write the results section first. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. It's, it's, it <laughs> It's really it's the worst thing you can give to students. It it it, it fits into this whole uh, problem that scientists uh, have have noticed in the past in the past little while that scientists often write their their story their studies as if they were stories, as if they were um, these nice exciting narratives that they want to get across the reader, rather than the reality, which is often you know sometimes results within one study contradict each other. Sometimes they contradict other papers. Sometimes it's a really messy picture and you just kind of have to, I've, I've been writing results sections and discussion sections where you just have to go, I have no idea why this result came out the way it did, because it just, it just did, it just happened this way. Um, 
Uh, whereas we're in, we're in, we're you know implicitly in in some cases, and in the case of Daryl Bem's paper, explicitly encouraged to um, to try and make it sound as if it was all a coherent story right from the start that we planned all these analyses out. Right. You know, you do you you do these analyses and then you you write it up as if you know before you even collected any data, this was always your plan. And that's one of the big the big problems with you know the way that we read a lot of the literature. It's deceptive in that in 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 that sense in that you 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 read a you read a study as if it was a you know the technical term people talk about is a is a confirmatory study. It, it was there to confirm a, stu- a a theory or a hypothesis, but um, but actually it was an exploratory study. It was just there to explore some data and check some stuff out. Um, and it's totally fine to do exploratory studies and check some stuff out. That's great, but don't write it up as if you had right. planned them all, all, all along. Yeah, you talk about the structure of scientific papers with their introduction and literature review, and then here was our hypothesis, and here's the methods we used to test it, and then here were the results, and here's our discussion uh, analysis of it, as if that's how they had set out the whole process from the beginning, yeah. which is not at all the case. And um, but it, but but if you think about it, um, you know, the way science is conducted from the beginning, you're a graduate student, you get accepted into a grad program, you're affiliated with some lab, some professor, somebody who already has a research program going. And so you just kind of step into that and you start doing his methods. And so this idea that, well, I'm just laying out the facts to see where they go and then I'm just going to follow these the, these uh, trends to see what, what we can, these exploratory trends to see who we can find that that's really not how it's done because the professor that's your boss, he's already got a program laid out and that's what you're going to do. Now, maybe by the time you're almost done, you can, for your, your dissertation, you branch off in some small little, uh, you know, uh, twig from that main program, but it's not likely to be some kind of earth shattering new uh, paradigm you're going to uh, innovate, innovate. Absolutely, it's kind of a, um, you, and you can easily see in that scenario where the inertia can come in of of, of scientists who kind of just get stuck into a, a mindset or a theory or some kind of uh, um, uh, theoretical position or even a even a statistical method. You know, people use the statistical method that they're told to use for their data, um, even though it might be the completely incorrect statistical method or it might have serious limitations. We've seen this quite a lot in in in, um, in psychological papers where you know there are methods, there are these statistical methods that just don't that are are not the correct thing to be using and yet they and yet they uh they're used because often people are just told well uh you know that this is this is what you should be doing this is you know you, what your professor tells you to do so um and you know one of the examples i give in the book to illustrate this kind of inertia or this kind of theoretical inertia that comes in is the uh the amyloid hypothesis mm. of uh of alzheimer's disease where um I mean, there is debate over this. It's it, it's a uh, you know it, it's not necessarily um, uh, exactly as it was described by a lot of these people that I'm about to mention. But but um, people who are, who go against this idea, which is the idea that the uh, amyloid beta plaques grow in people's brains and that is what causes Alzheimer's disease, um, people who have gone against that have kind of been bullied by people who hold to that theory. Kind of had their papers trashed. By the by, the kind of establishment because it's the kind of mm-hmm. major main main accepted theory in that area, um, and it does seem to have some serious flaws. And you know, there's there there are real problems with it. It may be that we've just never actually been able to properly test it because um, because uh, you know it it would take very different kinds of studies and studies that start much earlier in people's lives. You know, before the the, the, the plaque starts to come in. So you know, does it? The, the question is, does the plaque mm-hmm. cause Alzheimer's disease, or is it just? A, a kind of correlation is it just a kind of epiphenomenon of, of something else that's happening um but yeah people claim to have if they've if they've gone up against the kind of amyloid theory establishment to have their papers trash and you can see how that would work in this in the scenario you described there you know you join someone's lab they are a proponent of the amyloid hypothesis and they're saying well we're doing research on essentially trying to prove this hypothesis and you can see how it would be really awkward if you came up with data that kind of contradict their entire life's work or their theory that they believe or data that um that suggests an entirely different hypothesis right so even if you go out and you get your own professorship and you open your own lab and you start a new line of research the the barriers are still there at the journals because the peer reviewers may be the guy you were working with or his colleagues that that are promoting (laughs) the amyloid hypothesis yeah i thought that section in your book was really important because this is a serious problem uh alzheimer's and you know we baby boomers we're, we're starting to hit the wall now and this is going to be a huge problem you know so i'm i'm watching this closely like okay come on guys <laughs> you know, we, you know we're yeah. getting up there yeah. well that's that's the thing is that is that that particular for that particular disease unlike um cancer where huge progress has been made in in, in, in treating it 
um, cardiovascular disease. You know, there's been progress in the drugs that are, are, are you know, for, for those kind of um, for those kind of illnesses. Basically, there's been no progress in, in drugs or treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, we, we, we've I really know. not made yeah. much progress at all. And so the question is, like, is it because we've been, you know, stuck to this amyloid um, uh, theory, which might be completely wrong? And so and so, yeah, it. it in that, you know, some some people have made the case, and again, I'm not an expert in this in this area, so I, I you know, I don't want to make a pronouncement as to what I think is 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 definitely the case in the, in the literature. And again, it also might be that um, we just haven't actually tested it properly. Yeah, but the, but the but point is your, that, of your discussion of that is that one reason why we may not have made any progress is because this is the wrong line of inquiry. Yeah, precisely. And precisely. Uh, yeah, I uh, I know Rudy Tanzi, who's the big Alzheimer's guy at, at Harvard Medical. He's friends with uh, Deepak Chopra, and they 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 kind of collaborate. Like, what can oh. we do? Lifestyle, meditation, diet, you know, and, and so on to to, to quell the uh, attenuate the uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's. And but but when you push him sort of off the record. You know, because he's got a whole list like sleep and 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 this kind of diet and and exercise and so on and so on. It's like, but but is there any evidence that any of those actually like attenuate plaque buildup? Well, not really. Oh, okay, so yeah, right, exactly. So exactly. what what are we doing? I mean, should I do Sudoku puzzles? Is there any evidence for that? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the problem. There's there's there's, there's uh, I, you know, I'm not an expert in, in, in Alzheimer's, but one of the things I've, I've done quite a bit of research into is, is kind of normal cognitive aging. So just the mm. kind of standard, you know, decline in cognitive faculties that people experience as they get older that, that doesn't necessarily involve Alzheimer's, you know, mm. that just, that just uh, uh, kind of uh, can happen non-pathologically. And uh, yeah often we have to just throw up our hands when people ask us like what are the things we can do because uh things like doing sudokus uh you know taking part in intellectual activities are probably things that people have you know who are always smarter right from the start mm -hmm. of their, their their life they're all they're the sort of things they right. do anyway so you see this correlation between like people who are aging well cognitively and doing sudokus and stuff like that um but it but it but it's probably not there a was cause. that study of the nuns that were long lived and cognitively high functioning at old age well what did they do well they they prayed every day and they journaled and they <laughs> you know they did co cognitive games and it's like okay that's what we're going to do you have no idea if if the causal arrow points the opposite direction a huge selection effects yeah. and uh, yeah. yeah 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 so well but again that's and you know that's a uh, in the news these days between Trump and and Biden you know they're both co you know getting older and they're cognitively yeah. You know, you sort of hold your breath until they they they, they get to the end of the sentence or the thought. And, you, <laughs> yeah. and in the case of Biden, it's he has a hard time finishing his thought, and Trump just ends up in some other place. And you you do wonder, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, what about cognitive functioning? So that's an, another important area of research. Well, um, before we get to the the solutions to those, because because that's the important part of your book, uh, just hit, hit some examples of some of the other uh, simpler ones like fraud. You know, why would a uh, respected tenured professor scientist just make up data yeah it's 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 a it's a great question because you kind of think well you've got so much to lose you know these people when when you're discovered to have committed fraud you lose your job your papers all get retracted from the scientific literature you're disgraced forever um it's you know it's such a it's such a, a terrible thing to have done so you know the, the the example that i open with in the book is the the dutch psychology professor diederik stapel who made up i think um, he has had 58 papers retracted from the scientific literature. So he's a social psychologist. And they were all like snappy findings, like um, uh, people who have more uh, have messier desks are more racist. Uh, vegetarians are more are, are less selfish than meat eaters. You know, all, all this kind of stuff, which you can imagine, like the headline in the news right there. And it, it's easy to interpret and easy to, to uh, sort of cite and so on. But nobody had bothered really trying to replicate those findings. Um, and if they had, they would probably have found that uh, they didn't work because he made up the data. He literally sat with an Excel spreadsheet and typed in the numbers uh, into his into his spreadsheet. And then he, he gave those data to collaborators he had this whole network of collaborators who did who had no idea that he was just giving them fake data they thought he was really productive and he was running all these experiments and actually he was just he was just making it up from scratch um, and so yeah so he and lots of other um, people i mentioned in the book who who made up their results who fake their figures in 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 uh, you know microscope photos and photoshopped <laughs> that was um, amazing. uh in, in all these ways which you know once you see it it's really obvious it's like oh that part of the picture is identical to this part of the picture uh, why didn't I notice this? But the peer reviewers, you know, it, 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 it can get um, it just goes right past sometimes. So the question is, why? Like, why are these people doing this? Well, um, I think, you know, we can discuss this this more broadly. But I think the 
the scientific, um, the academic establishment or the academic uh, system pushes people towards extreme productivity, right? You've got to keep coming up with these papers. You've got to keep coming up with novel results. You've got to keep coming up with exciting new findings. It's part of the same problem of the the psychic uh, research where the new finding was the one that the journal seized on and our replication, they just, they just trashed it immediately. Um, uh, they've, you've got to keep coming up with this stuff. And I think in most cases, this pushes scientists towards like, low quality research like it pushes it, it, it makes them uh have you know essentially haste instead of instead of uh, scrupulousness um but in the extreme case i think when you have people who are really uh pushed to it and who are at the very very extreme end of people who just like don't care about uh about getting things wrong they commit fraud i also think uh um they have a kind of weird relationship with the truth. I think a lot of these people actually believe in the finding. They believe that the research is true that they're doing, that the finding is is, is real. And they just think it needs an extra little push. They yeah. need to just like convince their their colleagues with with this really important uh, you know new piece of data. That was certainly the case for um uh, another guy I mentioned in the book, uh, Jan Hendrik Schoen, who's a German uh, physicist who published dozens and dozens of papers in the top research journals, Nature, Science, loads of really good physics journals, and had them all retracted because of because they were all just made up. He just made up the results, never shared them with anyone else. But he seemed to, when he was asked, you know, he didn't just say hands up. I, I, you know, I made I made these data up. Um, uh, he said, sure, I made these data up, but it's real. But the finding right. is real. So there's this kind of really strange relationship with what's true and and what's needed to 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 uh, to in, prove. In a way, it's uh, a little bit your, your like case. when when Uri Geller would get busted for for doing a magic trick, and and, and people <laughs> yeah. like Randy would say, "You see, you're just doing magic." Well, no, no, no. I I uh, yesterday I was doing it the psychic way, but it doesn't always <laughs> work. So I sometimes I yeah. have to cheat yeah. because you guys are putting the pressure on me to perform. Right. <laughs> Right. I think that's exactly that's exactly the sort of the sort of theory. I mean, who knows, right? You can't take these people by the word in, in, in science and right. maybe maybe uh, take them take them at their word. It's probably, you know, a lot of them probably are just kind of more psychopathic personalities that are just like wanting to try and take over the the, the field. And and one of the big problems is that um that it's there's very little deterrence for this. There's very little you 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 have a very low likelihood of getting caught yeah. um if you if you if you fabricate research. Um uh, uh, so much of it just happens. You know, I have friends who are data sleuths or data detectives or whatever you want to call them, who kind of devote large portions of their time to discovering problems in articles, you know, looking at the data, finding, oh, that looks a little bit too good to be true. That looks way too good to be true. That's a finding that just could not be true. Um, and yet it's published in the journal. It's been lying there for sometimes decades. And when you email the editor about it, they often really drag mm. their feet about, you know, investigating, mm -hmm. getting things done because it causes a huge amount of trouble for them. It's embarrassing for them. Um, so, you know, the consequences are often not really, you know, are, are often not really much. And it takes a huge push. You know, I tell the story in the, in the book of Paolo Macchiarini, who is this uh, um, uh, surgeon who worked at the Karolinska Institute in in in, uh, in Sweden, which is one of the world's top universities. It's the place where the um, the uh, the Nobel Prize in, in medicine and physiology is given out. So you get your call from 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 Stockholm um, if you win the Nobel Prize. Like they had a guy working for them who was writing fraudulent papers about his uh, windpipe operations and killing mm -hmm. patients and in, 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 in doing it. And it took them years, uh, including after several investigations that made it really clear what was happening. They were massively re recalcitrant in in, uh, in 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 doing anything about it. So um, I think uh, fraudsters, you know, can get away with it for a long time. And I think if you if you let people get away with things, they will they will uh, they'll do yeah. it. Yeah, I had uh, Daniel Kahneman speak for me at Caltech when he was touring for his uh, Thinking Fast and Slow book. You mentioned this in, in your mm. in your book, um, and it was funny because the, the replication crisis was just starting to take off. Then it was kind of filtering into the into the media, uh, like there's some sort of problem with these priming experiments. Some of the other ones were like if you mm -hmm. hold a, a glass of warm water versus cold water, you're more likely to evaluate That's somebody right. in a warm, positive way. And yeah. like something like people at the top of an escalator give more money than people at the bottom of the escalator. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, there's just yeah. dozens of these kind of cutesy, kitschy type psych experiments. Anyway, so Kahneman starts in on some of this and then he pauses and he says, assuming anyone actually did this research and everybody's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of people are like um, sort of suspect that uh, maybe some of the stuff isn't isn't real. Um, uh, but that whole priming field is a, is a really good example of, um, of 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 a lot of these biases. Not necessarily a fraud. I mean, 
it, it's very hard to, to 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 prove, and I don't think you know you would say. Um, I don't think there's many cases in the world of kind of priming research that have been. Uh, fraudulent in in this kind of cutesy priming yeah. stuff that you mentioned. By the way, my favorite example is um, one where the people came into a room and there was a box in the middle of the room, a cardboard box, and uh, they had to either sit in the box while they did a, a creativity test or sit uh, beside the box. And the result in the paper was that people who were sitting outside of the box if you see what I mean, uh, had higher scores on the creativity <laughs> test than the people inside. It's like, it just can't possibly be true. It's obviously so silly and obviously wrong. Something has gone wrong. Or, or measurement um, error, like the, the other one with, uh, if you prime subjects with uh, words that remind them of old people, and then you have them walk yeah. down the hallway, they walk slower. But that was just a measurement yeah. error. Yeah, once you did it with um, infrared beams rather than participants, um, rather than experimenters sitting with stopwatches, once you did it with the infrared beams, the result disappeared. Yeah, uh, yeah the other priming one, uh, you didn't discuss this in your book, but I, I wrote about this in uh, Heavens on Earth, my book on, on the search for immortality, because when I started researching this book, I ran into terror management theory. And terror management oh, theory, yeah. I don't know how much you know about it, but it's all based on these priming experiments in which you prime subjects to think about mortality or their death or you know, and so forth. And then they, they change their behavior, their evaluations, judges allegedly um, give harsher sentences. Uh, and they have this whole thing about, you want to uh, like enforce the, uh, you know, the kind of hierarchical worldview, a more conservative perspective, harsher punishments, uh, all this to do allegedly with attenuating your anxiety about dying. So then, then they had this whole thing that mm -hmm. begin that starts with, Ernst Becker's book uh, about the you know this kind of paradox of 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 um, of mortality that we're the only species that knows we're going to die, and therefore this creates this uh, system of anxiety that we have to quell by doing things like being super productive and creative and art and music and and it, I'll just read a, a portion of this um, so that it's sure. a terror management theory invented by the psychologist Sheldon Solomon Jeff Greenberg and Tom. Uh, Przensky, and uh, and their their big book on this is the worm at the core: the role of death in life. So this was Ernst based right. on Ernst uh, Becker's, uh, and this whole idea that um, uh, according to TMT, awareness of one's mortality focuses the mind to produce positive emotions and creations to avoid the terror that comes from confronting one's death. So here's Solomon explaining that humans manage this terror by embracing cultural worldviews, beliefs about reality, shared with other group members to convey to each of us a sense that we are valuable individuals in a meaningful universe, and hence eligible for literal and or symbolic immortality. Accordingly, people are highly motivated, albeit quite unconsciously, to maintain faith in their cultural worldviews and a confidence in their self-worth, in other words, self-esteem, and threats to cherish beliefs and or self-esteem instigate defensive efforts to bolster their worldviews and self-esteem. So they go on and on about all of civilization is due to this terror <laughs> management. And uh, yeah. it, it, anyway, I mean, so I wrote first, uh, it's not obvious why contemplating death would lead people to experience terror and get defensive about cultural worldviews or feel the need to bolster self-esteem. It could just as well lead people to feel more sympathy for others who, after all, are in the same existential boat. Sure. Uh, second, yeah. why wouldn't such despair lead people to just give up on building or creating anything since it's fruitless in the long run, if not the short? And then, of course, the whole thing depends on this unconscious state of mind. Well, how do you know that that's what they're afraid? I'm not afraid of death. <laughs> how do you know this guy's afraid? Of well, because we primed him. Yeah. You know, so then. Yeah. And then you've got those high quality experiments. Yeah, it um, it uh, uh, it seems to me like it's a theory that explains everything and thus probably doesn't explain much uh, at all. Like, or you could you could invoke this to explain pretty much any empirical set of results or reality. That, that's right. Well, so they have this whole thing about um, even in our hunter gatherer ancestors, uh, they were motivated by this death terror to, to do certain things. And so um, it, it's kind of an evolutionary oh. just so story. So I found um, mm -hmm. I'm looking for um, uh, David Buss's analysis of this whole thing here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah, here is uh, TMT is anchored in an outmoded evolutionary biology that stresses survival, but ignores reproduction. It fails to delineate precisely how the hypothesis hypothesized psychological mechanisms help humans solve actual adaptive problems of survival and reproduction, and instead focuses nearly exclusively uh, inwardly on psychological protection. 
and it fails to consider why anxiety itself would have evolved, and it fails to account for known sex differences in social motivation, death rates, and causes of death rates. And then finally, you know, it's like, in my mind, I'm priming these subjects to think about death. And so I construct in my head questions that I think will prime that, or key words. How do you know that that's what's going on in their head? So this is yeah. what my friend yeah. Frank Soloway, who, um, uh, who, who, t- who wrote a book about Freud, and he, he, he says that the oh, really yes. tricky thing with theories like this is not what to do with statistical refutations, but rather what to do with supposed statistical confirmations. This problem previously <laughs> yeah. arose in connection with psychoanalysis, and Hans Eisnick and others later wrote books showing that the, those zealous psychoanalytic devotees testing their psychoanalytic claims systematically failed to consider what other theories besides the one the researchers thought they were testing would also be confirmed by the same evidence. So in other words, even if all these uh, priming experiments for terror management turn out to be replicated, how do you know that's what's actually going on inside the person's head? Yeah. Yeah. It's like the next step beyond all this replication stuff. Cause you know, replication is, is is great and it's been one of our major problems in psychology and lots of other fields too including you know medicine and lots of other places but um it, you know if you're not doing the experiment right if it's not actually testing a theory properly if it's not actually giving us uh you know it's not well designed then you can replicate all you want but it won't actually get us any further in our understanding right. of the world um i think my understanding is in this case the terror management stuff um i haven't read the paper but i saw there was a kind of large-scale replication attempt very mm. recently where they'd failed to oh, replicate really? Lots of the terror management uh, basic priming stuff. Um, I, I, I shouldn't uh, uh, speculate on, on it because I can't remember the details, but um, certainly I can send you the, uh, the, the by, article. By the way, I was at the TED up. conference when Amy Cuddy gave her power posture ah. uh, talk. And, it, 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 and Stuart, this was the funniest thing. Afterwards, people are walking around with their shoulders back and their neck up. And, you know, they're <laughs> like, oh, I'm power power yeah. posing here. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a, it's a very convincing. And, and, you know, if you watch the talk, uh, you think, wow, this is someone who's really, you know, it was. The, it would be the sort of thing that um, you would think there would be actual solid scientific research uh, backing up. But in fact, there was a, a I think this has been seen by 60 yeah, something yeah. million people. I mean, so it's the second most watched TED talk of all time, the, the Amy Cuddy uh, TED talk on, on, power, on power posing. And um, yeah, it's been seen. It's been seen by all those people. And yeah, it's based on 42 people. That was the experiment that she based it on. One experiment of 42 people. Um and there's been huge debate in the psychological literature, you know, on, on you know, she's she's run a meta-analysis that apparently shows that priming works and other people have run a meta-analysis that shows that, sorry, power posing, I should say, uh, works. And other people have, have shown that, it, that, that actually that's massively flawed. And actually, again, it, it's, it's one of these things where it doesn't necessarily test whether it's you've made some people sit up straight and that's the, the effect that makes them feel more powerful, that makes them like change their hormones and all this sort of stuff. Um, or it's because the other people are slouched uh, down and that, that might actually be the thing that's having the effect. Like it has a negative effect rather mm-hmm. than power posing having a positive effect. So again, it's like, we can replicate this experiment forever, but the interpretation is not necessarily uh, correct. But even with that, you know, that original that original uh, uh, talk is um, is a real and nice example of, of kind of research that's hyped up beyond the forty two people that it was done on. And actually, if you uh, the the lead author of that um, paper, so not Amy Cuddy, but uh, Dana Carney, mm-hmm. who's at uh, Berkeley, I think, um, she wrote an amazing uh, letter saying, "I basically, uh, you know, more recently, so a few years ago, saying I basically don't believe this mm-hmm. anymore." The, uh, the 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 research that we did, you know, the, the sample size was tiny. We uh, we kept running the statistics again until we found stuff. We didn't report all the statistical tests that we did. So we, we did loads of tests and just kind of reported the ones that were significant. Um, we dropped some participants out of the experiment um, uh, kind of willy nilly without really giving a without giving a real justification for, for why we did that. So she kind of said, you know, I'm. I, I'm out of this. You know, I don't want to believe mm. this anymore. Amy Cuddy still very much accepts mm. it, but um, you know, even her original authors, the co-authors on that paper, are skeptical now of of power Interesting. Posing. Yeah. Well, in the category of, of of more dangerous ideas is the whole vaccine autism Wakefield thing. I think a lot of people are still under Oops. the impression that maybe he just made a few mistakes or it was a complicated thing. He didn't mean to hurt anybody. No, you sh- you make it quite clear in the book this was outright fraud, and yet he's still huge here in America. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, the the investigative journalist uh, Brian Deere um, went through the. He actually obtained the medical records of the twelve children that Wakefield had included in his uh, study, where he'd claimed that 
the MMR vaccine, specifically the combined MMR vaccine, so not the three separate uh, ones, but the combined one, um, was related to gut-related symptoms and also autism in these in these kids. Um, Brian Deere found out that uh, Wakefield had had fabricated or or, or uh, deliberately altered. Um, when he'd reported it in his paper, the medical history of every single one of the children. So you had some of the kids who had been showing symptoms of autism way before they got their MMR vaccine, um, some who uh, it didn't happen until much, much later. But Wakefield claimed that in in in, uh, in all or almost all of the cases, um, they had they had started their symptoms of autism, you know, withdrawing socially, uh, getting repetitive uh, traits and so on. Um, just after they got their MMR vaccine. And so, um, you know, it, I think a lot of people are like, well, it, some people just think it's a correlation causation error that, um, you know, uh, he maybe noticed that these kids had these problems after they got an MMR. And, you know, it was a mistake to to make that uh, to make that leap. But that wasn't even the case. Like if you drill down into mm -hmm. the original data, they didn't even that didn't even happen. The MMR then autism thing just didn't happen. And so um, and then there were all the kind of revelations of it turned out that the uh, that he the 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 lawyers that were paying for that study were uh, there were lawyers for the parents um, and uh, Andrew Wakefield had a um, had a, uh, some interest some financial interest in the individual vaccines rather than the combined MMR ones so the com the individual mumps uh, measles rubella uh, vaccines and so he would have you know if uh, he would have profited massively if he had scared people off using the combined uh, vaccine so um yeah that that not just was you know wasn't just a mistake but it was a, a serious fraud and probably of all the frauds that i talk about in the book and that have happened you know recently probably the worst fraud mm -hmm. of all time in terms of the effects it's had on the uptake of vaccines and uh, the general you know vaccine skepticism movement it, it existed obviously beforehand i mean people have always been mm -hmm irrationally scared of vaccines but this gave it such a i mean i was going to say a shot in the arm but you know no pun intended it gave it such a like it gave it such a a boost and um uh, uh now of course it's it's had terrible effects all over the world and i suspect actually we might see some echoes of it when the vaccine yeah, for oh, covid-19 sure. appears oh, yeah. we might see some echoes of this you know well vaccines well don't they cause autism and, and they're already you know, um, ramping so, this up about you know bill gates just wants to chip us all through these vaccines and oh, you yeah, know, I'm not going to yeah. get back. I'm I'm going to practice my freedom. I'm going to go buy some guns. Okay, that'll do it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's gotten pretty crazy <laughs> here with that. this. You know, we we're not even there yet to have a vaccine, but there's people saying I'm not doing it. And I, I did see a recent study that maybe the herd immunity doesn't need to be over ninety percent, which would be good because I, I have a feeling there's going to be more than ten percent people that that refuse to get it. Um, yeah, my, my understanding is for measles, it, it, it 90% is the herd immunity, but for COVID-19, it might yeah. it might need to yeah. be, it could be lower than that. And, the, you know, the vaccine, you know, if there are lots of people who are not interested in the vaccine, then maybe that would yeah. be okay. But, yeah, uh, well, here again is one of these uh, areas where it's good that science cleans its own house because there are people ready to pounce on any kind of mistakes that somebody makes in the direction that they want it to go, of course. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> the other one that uh, I've always been troubled by is the whole diet, nutrition, heart disease, and and so forth. Uh, you know, I've had uh, Nina Teicholtz on the podcast and Gary Tobbs. They've been, you know, they've been challenging these, uh, you know, the food pyramid mm -hmm. and all this claimed link, causal link between uh, eating animal meat, fats and, and, and dairy and so forth and cholesterol and then heart disease. And, you know, this turns out to be one of these really hard causal problems to solve. Yeah. It, it's not it's much harder than, say, smoking and lung disease. And even that took decades to really to, to get uh, confirmation and, and consensus on. This is still going on, you know, uh, half a century after we got serious about studying it. So talk about what the difficulty is in the methodologies of, of drawing causality from those kinds of studies. Well, a big problem in nutritional research is that people collect these big correlational data sets. So, um, you know, they collect uh, food frequency questionnaires. People fill in food diaries in these big samples of people. So, you know, maybe 10,000 people in this big cohort study uh, give give us information on basically what they remember they ate in the past couple of weeks. You know, they write down stuff. So already there's an issue there of people um, not not only just failing to remember what they ate, but also um, giving us what they think we want to know. Right. Uh, you know, you had five hamburgers last week and oh, maybe I'll just write that I had <laughs> one. You know, um, you, you know, there's kind of a social desirability bias there as well as a memory bias of people just you know, just forgetting that they had an extra chocolate bar that day or whatever it is. Um, so there's a problem there. 
But then scientists will, you know, run these analyses, and there's a lot of information collected on lots of different foods, people, uh, people's uh, health in lots of different ways, their vascular health, uh, their, their amount of exercise they do, the, um, the, the, their, their psychological functioning, all these sorts of things. And so there's a huge amount of data just lying there, which you in these big cohort studies, these big samples that you can dredge through. Um, and you know, as I talk about in the book. If you run enough statistical tests, you will find something. You'll find something that's statistically significant just because of chance, just because just due to just due to complete chance. And so uh, uh, this is absolutely ripe, you know, for for this kind of data dredging Mm -hmm. analysis where you just you say, well, oh, look, it it looks like um, it looks like, I don't know, whatever it is, drinking red wine is associated with this particular health outcome. Let's publish that. Rather than saying, you know, right from the very start, we're going to test one hypothesis and one hypothesis only. We're not going to get distracted by, you know, all these other things that we could test. But we're just going to test this one thing and then see if it works out. It's that people have, you know, a very kind of um, promiscuous uh, uh, set of hypotheses that is going and just test loads of stuff. Um, so that's one problem. And then, and, and then, of course, even if the hypothesis was, you know, true and the statistics back it up and it's not just a fluke in the data and all that sort of stuff. This is correlational data, so you can't draw a causal conclusion from 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 this kind of uh, causal data, uh, correlational data. There are ways you can try and get around it. People use natural experiments. People use their new kind of genetic methods now that you can try and use to um, to uh, exploit the random variability in our genomes that might actually be able to um, g- give us causal conclusions from correlational data, which is really interesting. Um, the, 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 um, the technique of Mendelian randomization, it's called, which is a new thing in epidemiology. But that's kind of very, very new. Um, so, and then, and then the problem is that scientists often write up press releases as if the uh, the, the effect that they found, the, the correlation that they found, was actually a cause. Right. So, you should be doing this because we found that you know eating eggs is bad for your health in this way, or drinking milk is bad this way, or you know whatever it is. And then, you know, not only that, but then next week another person finds the result that completely contradicts that 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 previous one. Um, and so there's this great study of uh, of cookbooks where um, uh, they, they look through you know, all the ingredients in a, in a kind of a standard cookbook and um, then check the literature to see whether they've been associated with cancer uh, in some way. And of course, loads of them mm-hmm. had some of them with really big effects on producing. You know, this is this is really bad. It causes cancer. Some the same foods. Uh, there's evidence in the literature that, that it's against it. And um, you know. We'd expect there to be lots of variation in, in in the literature, even if the effect was real. You'd you expect there to be some studies that find it, some that don't, some that underestimate it, some that overestimate it. But I think a, a better explanation in this case is that people just you know dredge through these data sets and find any old thing. Um, and so I, I think it's basically no wonder that people have really no idea what they should be right. eating, what the right. best recommendations are um, uh, for, you know, is, is red wine good or bad? Is alcohol good or bad? Uh, keep seeing results that are, that are going in opposite directions. And I think people just throw up their hands and, and just say, well, I'll just I'll just have I'll just eat whatever yeah. I want, you know, um, uh, uh, because the nutritional research is just so, so. Clear. Yeah, it is. It's uh, I, I, I'm personally interested in it because I have heart disease in my family. So I exercise like a maniac and. And I, don't, you know, when I go to the Starbucks in the morning, I don't know if I should get the oatmeal or the egg sandwich. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. That's that. It's, it's a fundamentally like it, you'd think by now we would have some a really good handle on that. Um, and people have suggested that we just need to just take a step back and just simplify things down and just do some large randomized controlled trials of uh, of, of of you know some of these obvious food group differences and and, and so on. Um, but as I show in the book, that's not easy either. The the largest randomized control trial, or one of the one of the best, highest quality ones, the PREDIMED mm-hmm. trial, which was done in Spain uh, on the Mediterranean diet, which seemed to show that the Mediterranean diet was uh, was was positive uh, and and uh, beneficial for um, mortality and and heart disease. Um, it had loads of statistical problems where they had they'd made errors where they had uh, they had failed to randomize people in the right ways, and they had like. People who went to the same doctor all getting the same diet, uh, which would have thrown the results off. Um, and so and they, they, they've corrected them and they still think the results uh, show the, the same results. Although I, I think we should be somewhat more skeptical of it now that these big mistakes have been found in it. Um, you know, the paper had to be retracted mm-hmm. and it was replaced by a new by a new version. Um, but I just think um uh, even you know, even a study like that, which had loads of funding, it was really well designed, it was all really nicely set up. Even that had mm-hmm. big problems with its randomization and 
and so on. So, you know, <laughs> this idea of we just need some very simple randomized trials to find the answer, um, it's a lot more difficult to do it. You know, you just get lost in this big thicket of the yeah. administration of, of, of randomized controlled trials. Yeah. Yeah, some of the other uh, examples in your book that that bothered me. The uh, I read Matthew Walker's book on sleep, why we sleep. Oh. And th- now this is a field I know next to nothing about. I haven't really studied it. It's not something I pay attention to. And I love the book. I thought he was great. I watched him on Joe Rogan. You know, ten million people mm-hmm. watch this. Like, okay, I'm going to get this amount of sleep, and boom, boom, boom. And then I read in your book, like, yeah, oh yeah, no, yeah. not all of this was replicated or. Well, yeah, there was an amazing analysis done by the uh, so there's a blogger, Alexi Guzzi, did this amazing analysis where he just went through the first chapter of that of that book and found loads of m- mistakes, mis misstatements, um, over interpretations of research. You know, like again, like we talked about for the neuros- the um, nutritional research, uh, drawing causal claims from correlational data sets. Uh, um, and also an example where there seemed to be this there was a graph that showed I think it was. Um, it was like, well, you get five hours of sleep, six, seven, eight hours of sleep, and your risk of being injured. Right. Um, and uh, it, the risk of being injured with five hours of sleep was actually lower than uh, <laughs> than it was for for, uh, for for six hours of sleep. But he had cut that that bar of the graph mm. out before he put so it. So instead of the, it's and a it's U like, shape, he cuts off this part of the U, so it just goes like that. It just looks like getting more sleep is better across across right. the board. When actually that's not what the data showed. And and you know. I I think, as I say in the book, I think probably it is good to get right, lots of good sleep, right. and uh, that's like. But but why overstate it, and why overstate it to the point of you know chopping up data like that and making it look uh, you know more like more like your uh, your hypothesis? Um, and I think it can only be because you know, like we talked about right at the start, people want a nice clean story. That that five hours of sleep being being actually more beneficial in terms of in terms of it being injured. Is weird, and you have to kind of think about why that would be, and you have to think: is there other biases in the experiment? And you have to talk a lot more about, you know, wh- why such a, con- a sort of counterintuitive, complicated result would would be the case. So you have to actually, you know, give a bit more detail. But what he wanted for that book clearly was something simple and straightforward. Yeah. So he has just the nice line, right. um, and I think that's a, that is, you know, not just a problem in popular books, but it's a problem in science in general. Is this whole like, as I said, you know, the warts and all approach of um, uh, uh, just explaining your data as they actually are. Um, is 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 not what people want. People want a nice clean yeah. story. Well, I you know as an author of many nonfiction science books myself, I can tell you what the problem is in terms of book sales. I'd love to be Malcolm Gladwell. I'd love to you know just have that killer book that sells millions of copies. And he's a great writer. I love his books. But when I set out to write yeah. something like that, it never goes that way because it, it, it's so messy and and there's so many complications and. And it, it, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And, and my chapters, as I write them, they don't unfold in a beautiful narrative story like Malcolm's do. And, and, and but I can't, I can't just like, well, I'm just going to kind of simple. I'm not accusing him of simplifying consciously. He he's a great storyteller, and he gloms onto one study, and then he connects it to this other study, and then he has a couple of anecdotes, and he strings it all together in an incredible narrative. And uh, uh, but it, it's almost never like that in the real world of of how science yeah. operates. And, and so I think there's pressure maybe on Matthew Walker. Well, I, I have a contract to write a book about sleep. Okay. You know, what's, what's the simplest straightforward message I can give. And if, and if you wrote it, like you wrote it with, you know, all the, uh, all the subtleties there, it's not going to come out with a clean message. Yeah. Yeah. I suspect a, a book like that wouldn't have sold anything, you know, a book that really explains all the ins and outs and says, oh, we don't really know if this is the case. And this looks a bit, this looks a bit dodgy. And let's look into the statistics yeah. of this study. Obviously, that's not going to sell uh, as, as much as a, a book that says, you know, sleep, if you don't sleep, it will trash your immune system, you'll get cancer, right. you know, all the right. kind of stuff that, that the sort of statements that he uh, uh, was, was kind of focusing on. And again, I'm not saying that I think, you know, sleep is, is, uh, is, is not a massively important thing. It's just that, you know the data are complex, and they always are in every single in every single scientific field. Um, he has responded to some of those uh, complaints. I don't think he's responded to the thing about the mm. graph cutting the bar off the graph, but he's responded to some of the mm. other arguments. By the way, I should say just just to oh, give yeah, him his sure. good, uh, his, good, his good. there. Yeah. Um, so yeah. 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 Um, but but you know it, but it's the case for it's the case for lots of different uh, books. I mentioned several other books. You know, educational mm. books are a big are a big thing as well. Where psychologists who have done stuff on you know growth mindset, um, grit, these kind of educational fad things that come up, um, which 
you know, in almost every case, there is a kernel of truth there, and there is there is actually a real result that would maybe be beneficial in some small degree if we if we rolled it out to um, you know lots of different schools. You know, like growth mindset training is essentially saying to kids, you can change your uh, uh, abilities if you work hard. If you don't give up, you can you can change the way your brain works, and you can basically become smarter in some sense. I totally accept that that's true. I totally believe that. It's just that I wouldn't write a book saying or implying heavily implying that it's the most important thing ever. Uh, Carol Dweck's book on mindset makes it sound as if it's this life-changing, amazing, wonderful thing, just like sleep is in the Matthew Walker book. But if you look into the details, the experiments are small. Some experiments don't show much of an effect. Maybe there's an, there's an effect there overall. Again, that's not the sort of message that sells right. books. Now, I encountered this in, in the medical literature when my mom got brain cancer. She had these meningioma tumors that they took out, and this went on and on for about 10 years. And she had five craniometries and five radiation treatments and so on. And um, and so th then we kind of sort of hit the wall. There was not much else to do. This is back in the 90s. So I started looking at the, not really the alternative literature. It was still mainstream scientific literature of experimental treatments you could do for different kinds of brain tumors. And when you actually read the papers, you know, they go, well, maybe this drug here might work. And you read the papers, like an N of 12, and, you know, eight of them died. <sighs> and then, but four of them lived two months longer on average. It's like, that's what you're encouraging me to yeah. read. This is yeah. so depressing. And this is published. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, 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 you know, th that's something again, which comes up is this kind of spin that even if you get a result that doesn't look that good, you can often write your paper, the abstract, which is the bit that most people look at, of course, because it's a bit that's available for free. Um, you can make it, you can just write it up as if you found right. a significant, important, really exciting result. And that's what so many scientists do. And there's lots of evidence of, you know, people have scanned through the literature and, you know, specifically looking for this spin and finding that, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, people are just just blithely exaggerating. Well, the that's result. your hype section of, of, of your book. It's like you yeah. read, you, you hear some, something on the news about like the, the rate of this particular cancer, you know, went up a hundred percent and and you're like, Oh my God. But when you read the paper, it's like one out of a, one out of 100,000, get it now two out of 100,000. It's like, Oh yeah, right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So the base rate of it. Yeah. <laughs> So you can give you can give a very partial uh, bit of the story, and then uh, and it makes it, it it hypes things up, and and probably helps you get your next grant, helps you get your next uh, you know uh, your next paper, helps you get your paper published in the journal in the first place. So you know you can see why scientists are doing it because there's this huge pressure to keep coming up with papers, right, keep publishing right. stuff, um, uh, and so you can see why they're hyping this stuff up, um, and also you know. Getting your papers covered in the media is, is really exciting for a lot of scientists. Um, getting a book contract to write about how your field of research is the most important thing and, and, and you know, whether it's mindset or sleep or whatever it is, um, is a great thing. And so you can see there are all these incentives that are pushing scientists towards, you know, hyping things up and also, by the way, making lots of mistakes and, you know, being far too hasty with the research and so on. Um, and not towards the thing that we want science to be doing, which is, of course, this getting yeah. it right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Phil Zimbardo Stanford Prison Experiment you discuss. I've, I've followed that pretty closely. I know Phil, and and I actually did a replication of this uh, in part for uh, Dateline NBC with uh, Chris Harris, Chris Hansen, um, and right. uh, we we ran seven subjects through uh, the, the exact same experiment. We had that we we made up the box with the toggle switches. Oh no, I'm sorry, not that. That's the the, the, the um, uh, Stanley Milgram shock experiment. Milgram. Yeah, we did that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. now we. They were very closely related. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's, they were in the same class. part of that kind of sixties, seventies guerrilla social science, where you know we're going to try to figure out why the Nazis did what they did. Okay, so you know, are we all Nazis, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So we we redid Milgram's experiment. The problem with redoing Zimbardo's experiment is you, you really ethically you couldn't get it approved anywhere. But it's not even really an experiment. It, it's really more just sort of a. I, I don't know, just an a, example of what people may or may not do. There's no control groups. Yeah, it was it was kind of just a happening. Like it was just it was just something that occurred that he and 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 you know the the thing I mentioned in the book is that more recently um, some of the tapes have come out, like the transcripts mm. of the of the tapes that were made at the time have come out that that weren't known before. I mean, obviously this this uh, experiment was massively controversial right from the start, and and controversial in its implications as well. This is the one where you know you get people in the in the basement of the Stanford Stanford prison, uh, the base, sorry, the basement of the Stanford psychology department and turn it into a prison. And some people are made to be guards and some people are made to be uh, um, uh, prisoners and the guards end up really badly abusing the, the, the prisoners. Um, and, uh, but of course the guards, it turns out, if you see the transcripts, the ones that are now available, the guards were being 
uh, told by Philip Zimbardo basically what to do. He said, you know, you really need to, you really need to, 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 um, to hurt these guys. You need to really punish them if they do things wrong. You should, you should tell them that they're not allowed to go to the bathroom and, you know, all this kind of stuff, which they then, sure enough, went and did. Um, and it was almost as if the, the guards, they were, the guards were being told that they were doing an experiment on the prisoners um, and that they were almost, that they were almost the Confederates in the experiment, which is just not, um, the word experiment yeah, not the right, is not yeah. something that should be used in that case. Um, and so all the kind of implications of that, again, Philip Zimbardo has written a, you know, very popular book, The Lucifer Effect on, on, on it. And, and, you know, that study is taught to every psychology undergraduate student yeah. in the world, I yeah. would imagine. Yeah. Like that's one of the most important. Well, he, he himself said um, he, he gave them the mirrored sunglasses because he got that idea from that film, Cool Hand Luke, where the prison guard <laughs> wore mirrored sunglasses. And then he had a theory about this, that it, 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 you know, blinding the people to the eyes, there's no eye contact and it dehumanizes uh, each person. And, and then the bags over the head. Well, he said that they came up with this idea of putting uh, bags over the prisoners' heads. And then he fast forwards to Abu Ghraib and shows, look, this is what they did. Uh, yes. and I didn't coach anybody yeah. to do this. So part of his counter is that uh, the Abu Ghraib is an example of bad barrels rotting bad, uh, good apples and making bad apples, uh, is that this happens naturally anyway. So my Stanford prison you know, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it is validated by the real world. It's like a, a I, I think at um, at best, it's kind of like a hypothesis generation activity. Like I did this and I can now have these hypotheses about, you know, human behavior that we might try and test in some way. And obviously, as you said, ethically, it's very difficult to to think about how you would test these things. But, you know, with enough kind of ingenuity, a psychologist could come up with experiments that would test the sort of hypotheses that would be generated by something yeah. in the standard, like the Stanford prison experiment. But of course, that never was the case. We're just we're just given that that particular uh, occurrence. And then all the conclusions are drawn from from that rather than there being a big line of research. And I think that stands in for a lot of problems in psychology where there's one not particularly good experiment that was done in the first place and then everybody else goes off and does their own thing and cites that that experiment but never tries to replicate it or or, or really check that the results there are, are, are really solid um and we go off and build all these you know large um uh uh, uh kind of edifices yeah. of research um that are based on a really dodgy foundation yeah well Meldrum's uh research has, has been replicated but it's it's back to this. How do you know that it's obedience to authority that is driving this? Because you're talking about what's going on inside somebody else's head, which we cannot know. Yeah. So I, I create yeah. this word obedience. That's what it is. It's obedience. Well, like in the, the replication we did at NBC, we, we have these people trying out for a, a reality television show called What a Pain. And they're there at the NBC studios mm -hmm. and there's executive <laughs> producers walking around and camera crews. So our people are, yeah. they're not thinking, well, I have to obey the authority. They're thinking, well, I'm trying out for a TV show and obviously they're not going to let me hurt somebody. Yeah. 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 They kind of, they could see through it, but they were kind of playing along. And, uh, and, and so the question, I mean, the question that might, that might also have applied to the original Milgram experiment. Like that's at least some of them kind of thought, well, yeah. this is, I'm at, yeah, I'm at this Yale University. Kind of, I mean, what, what, what? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm playing along yeah. here. Um, so, so yeah, it's another example of like, how do you interpret the results, even if they are replicable? Yeah. But I mean, like in the, in the attempts to explain why Germans became Nazis and, and how you get um, these, uh, you know, normal people in a matter of a year or so to kill Jews in an open pit or, or, or whatever, um, you know, obedience to authority is just way too simple of an explanation. There's just so many other factors going along there and, and, you know, they got, a lot of them got shit faced afterwards, you know, so they drank a lot. Uh, you know, there were some, pr sometimes there were pressure to do it or else, but other times there weren't. So you, but you're going along mm -hmm. with it. Uh, there was a lot of anti-Semitism, you know, so in, in other words, human behavior is so multi-causal, multi-factor, uh, and yeah. maybe we're over-determining it in a way, but then the way science is structured, well, I got to test one hypothesis. So I'm going to control for all the other variables <laughs> yeah. and I'm just interested in this one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You can see how uh, this happens a lot is, is psychologists will, will have their, their one thing that they think is really important and they will then apply it to every, to every, you know, societal, you know, place that it could possibly be uh, uh, taken to. And, and, you know, it's, it's the case in these educational things that I mentioned, you know, mindset and, 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 and so on. It's made to sound as if that is the one thing that if you do it right, your kid will excel at school, no problem at all. 
But we know that kids learning at school is going to be associated with a huge bunch right. of factors, social things, just things about their own levels of ability, their teacher, their their general, you know, the state of their, uh, you know, how their school is and, and, and its, its level of funding and all. I mean, endless stuff. Um, uh, not just one factor. So, yeah, these one factor theories are just yeah. uh, uh it's you like know, colleges a, and, and a universities goal. in part justifying their huge tuitions by saying, well, you'll make more money if you get a bachelor's degree. And if you get a graduate degree, you'll make even more money. It's like okay. as if yeah. that's the single cause, you know, this, you know, right. well, maybe right. your parents sent you to college and they're more intelligent or they read more. or They have more books mm -hmm. in the house mm -hmm. or maybe they gave you a different cultural yeah. background or, you know, it's maybe it's partly genetic. And, you know, there are 20 different variables that yeah. could explain this. <laughs> um yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a. Um, I, th I think when people do kind of publicity stuff like that, they lower the standards of the evidence they need to accept. And the problem is, and again, this is something that's you know that we've discussed several times, is that a lot of scientists are when they're talking about when they're putting the results out into the world, they're engaged in publicity. They're not engaged in. They're not really engaged in doing science. They're engaged in trying to publicize things. And so, why make it more complicated than it needs to be? Let's just talk about one thing. Let's just talk about how sleep will, you know, is is the real thing that will, you know, solve all these problems, getting people their eight hours of sleep, um, rather than saying, well, you know, if you could build, if you had in your head, like the diagram of all the different things that that, that, that lead to someone living longer or being healthier, or whatever, it would look enormously complex and sleep would just be in one little corner of that. And it would have a little arrow going out to lots of other things, you know, actually really important. And if you did an experiment, sleep deprivation, I'm sure people would, you know, would, would end up much worse off. Um, but it would just be one part of that huge, big tapestry. Yeah. I just read uh, Judea Pearl's book called The Book of Why about his uh, research and mm -hmm. understanding causality and how people that are steeped in that kind of research methodology, statistics and determining causality from correlation and so on. It is so complicated and so messy and there's not that much consensus even among the people that specialize in understanding how to interpret causality from causation uh, from from correlation you know they're they're not in that much mm -hmm. agreement and they have all these uh statistical models and, and diagrams with arrows going all over the place and it's like this is really messy yep. Yeah, the world of, um, you know, even even if you look at something like epidemiology, where you'd think one of the main questions that you learn straight off the bat is like, what, how, do you, how do you show that something causes something else? Um, the arguments are absolutely crazy. And not just epidemiology, but, you know, economics is another subject where, you know, working out the causes is sort of a massively important thing. And so they have all these instrumental variable strategies where they're like, there's been some variation in the oil price that might have caused this variation, and then we're going to use this as an instrument to this. And 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 you know, um, there's a lot of really good mathematics going on there. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of really exciting, you know, new ways to analyze data to actually kind of almost magic uh, a causal interpretation from correlational data if you get, if you get the right data set right. up. But a lot of it, if you if you kind of push back, a lot of it really is based on almost a kind of verbal argument that. Uh, you know that this the only way that the oil prices would have affected you know education or whatever is the way that I can think of, and not any other not any other way that might have you know like a, a kind of a a backdoor that might have uh, might have uh, been a kind of confounding effect in this analysis. Um, so there are all these really interesting strategies that economists are using, and I mentioned earlier the genetic uh, strategy that now you can use the Mendelian randomization mm. to try and use variation in the genome to say whether alcohol causes cardiovascular disease or, or something like that, whatever it happens to be. Um, but a lot of these are kind of in their infancy. And I, I, I guess they're going to be subject to exactly the same sort of problems as the other analyses I'm talking about, that once people you know, are able to do them at the push of a button, they'll just be doing them all over the place. They'll just running these analyses with every single every single variable and, uh, and publishing a lot of well, I love your discussion well. about smoking and, and lung cancer. And, and, and in part, in, in retrospect, we look back at that and think, well, it, it took so long to determine causality because of the ideological uh, bias of the tobacco companies who were paying these scientists yeah. to find the certain uh, results that they wanted. Or they were planting the seed of doubt, uh, as in, you know, the, the jury is not in, the science is still mm -hmm. uh, not determined, there's no consensus yet. And, you know, they started all those those trends that the climate deniers kind of picked up on. But then you showed that in fact, the, mm. some of the arguments like, well, there might be a gene for smoking or a gene for, for, for having tobacco smoke cause cancer because some sm people smoke their whole lives and they lived a hundred. How do you explain that? And then you talked about, I think it was in uh, the study in 2015 of a gene that does affect whether or not tobacco smoke can cause cancer in your lungs. And I thought, Oh wow. Okay. So 
even that seemingly simple uh, a causal inference there is not that simple. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, genetics in particular has, has been as, you know, as massively moved on in the last few years. We're, we're getting all these new these new techniques and things are becoming much more complex. And even things which, you know, just just a couple of years ago, we we're really excited about, you know, polygenic scores, predicting uh, people's behaviors and so on. And, you know, the the in the last couple of years, maybe maybe slightly longer, but, you know, in the last little while, there are all these extra complications of different population stratification and people living in different places that might mean that their genetics are uh, are kind of uh, uh, confounded in some in some way or that they they, they they pattern in different ways that might confound the analysis um and so yeah loads of stuff from genetics um it's kind of it's kind of moving on at such a pace uh, and and extra complexity is being added in all the time um but i think you know the, the smoking and lung cancer case is a really good one because um because it illustrates the, uh, the the need for for triangulation, and that's something which um, you know one could almost write a whole new book about. But the idea there is that instead of just replicating the same result over and over again using the same methods, you bring in lots of different types of study that are based on entirely different foundations. So if you're worried about the genetic stuff, then you can bring in other uh, research. You can bring in, um, you know, in the in the in the smoking lung cancer case, you can bring in. Um, they ran studies on rats where they like put. A cigarette tar mm-hmm. and the, uh, on them, and it caused uh, you know cancer to grow at a higher rate. Um, and uh, there's epidemiological studies of of, of of smokers, but there's also you know there's also studies um, using kind of natural experiments. And you and it all kind of triangulates. It all comes together. All hangs together, um, pointing towards the fact that smoking causes lung cancer, and not um, the fact that um, and not and not this idea that uh, you know you need to, you, you can only do it with an experiment. You you just need to do a randomized controlled trial, and you need to force people to smoke and people to not. That's never right. going to happen. But if you triangulate the research, and this can this can occur across lots of different fields, you can make much you can make much better progress. So I think that's almost like the next step beyond the stuff I'm talking mm-hmm. in the book is like once we've got our handle on the, the you know that that we can actually trust each of the individual findings that the findings are, are real and they're not biased or fraudulent or whatever. Then we can start to triangulate across different fields and really make proper scientific yeah. progress. Uh, let's talk about the end of your book then, since we're over an hour here now, uh, about what the solutions mm-hmm. to all this is. Obviously, we're not going to abandon science. It's the best tool we have for understanding causality. You're not a postmodernist saying yeah. that this is all socially constructed and there is no reality. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> no, no, not in the slightest. So, so just kind of walk and, us through I, like I, the, I agree the, the half dozen most important things we could do to correct some of these problems. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I totally agree. I mean, the reason I wrote this book is that is that science is super important, and we need it. It's really precious, and we need to get it right. Um, it, it's one of the most important things, probably the best thing we've ever invented as as, as the, you know the humans the human species. Um, so so yeah, getting it right is super important. So um, I think some of the major changes need to be made at the level of uh, universities. So universities need to start um, thinking not in terms of who's got the longest CV. Uh, who's got the papers in the top journals, who's got the most exciting looking results, but rather think about which scientists are the ones that are contributing to this more kind of open culture, which scientists are the ones that are putting their data online and sharing it with the community, that are coming up with new tools to analyze stuff, that are um, that are publishing um, uh, replication studies of other people's work, that are generally being kind of good scientific citizens in the sense that they are contributing to the, to the thing rather than just building up their own CV and building up their own labs, you know, reputation. So I think universities can like reward. And in the US, you know, you have the whole tenure system where you give you give a, a tenure to people and tenure committees are in t- to a great extent looking for people with long CVs and lots of exciting papers published in, in, in journals um, in, in high impact journals. That is, you know, the most prestigious, glamorous glamorous journals so um we need to we need to kind of do away with this culture or at least lessen that culture of kind of neophilia this kind of obsession with new exciting stuff and 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 have more of an emphasis on let's just make sure that finding is true is that really is that really is that really correct um so that's one thing and the same can be said for for research funders so people who you know uh these these charities and government bodies and so on that fund research can fund research not that's just the flashiest most exciting stuff um, but can but can actually you know push towards uh, uh, solid replicable research. Um, scientists themselves can be can be more open and transparent. Uh, at the moment, if you email a scientist and say, "Can you send me your paper?" they're delighted. If you email them and say, "Can you send me your data?" Uh, mm. they're a bit more reluctant. In fact, you might never get a response. Um, and in fact, this has been done in experiments. People have actually sent out you know experimental emails to scientists saying you know to a whole range of scientists saying, "Can you send your data?" And uh, you know they get such a low mm-hmm. response rate that you know. 
it's, it's really, really quite depressing. And that's, you know, that might be because scientists are, um, it's not because they're, they're hiding anything or they think the data are fraudulent or wrong. It's often because the data are a complete yeah. mess and yeah. they, they, they would have to spend a couple of days like tidying them all up before anyone could interpret what was in there. So that's all really, that's all really important. The journals that they're publishing in can change as well. So one of the changes I describe in the book is that there are some journals, this is an idea that originated in uh, clinical trials, that are forcing scientists to register their mm. results before mm. they write anything. So instead of this idea that you get the data and you just dredge through it and find any old thing and then publish it, you got to write down what you're going to do first. So clinical trials have been required to at least do some kind of minimal registration of what the overall aim of their paper is. Um, since about 2000, 2004, that kind of period was when it was starting to kind of uh, kick off. Um, nowadays in psychology, this is much more common. And psychology journals have actually, um, so the journal Cortex, which mm. is a kind of neuropsychology journal, has instituted this really cool um, uh, strategy where it's called re registered report, where instead of submitting your whole experiment, you just submit your introduction and your method section. So you submit your plan, basically, and it gets peer reviewed. Mm. And then the journal decides uh, the journal says, OK, we agree that this is a good experiment. Uh, the peer reviewers you know, have given you some advice on how to do it. And they all agree that if this experiment were to be done, that it would be published. So you get your um, the journal gives its permission that says this will be published no matter what results come out. If it's negative, if it's positive, if it's weirdly uninterpretable, we will still publish the, the, the paper. And that kills this idea of publication mm -hmm. bias where scientists are like pr publishing only the positive right. research and not the negative research. It kills it stone dead. It's 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 a it's such a great idea. It also, you know, there's lots of other problems that it that it deals with just in one just in one go. So I think journals can change the not just the kind of research that they accept. So they should be more open to replication studies, but they should also be um, changing the 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 kind of publication kind of strategy that they have and have much more um, of scientists registering results and uh, registering analyses before they do them. And that's not to say that they can do lots of exploration, that they can that they they, they shouldn't be able to explore stuff. It's just that you have to say that. It's just that you should say that in the paper. Here are the hypotheses we planned beforehand. Here's the, our tests of them, one, two, three. And here's the hypotheses that we came up with kind of ad hoc as we were going through the data. That's totally fine. But the reader should know that those were the ones that you came up with ad hoc because they might be a bit less likely to be true. And that's totally fine. Um, but you should just be honest and transparent about it. So this whole open science movement, which you know can, can take into account universities, journals, scientists themselves, funders, um, is just at base just tell the truth just be transparent tell the truth and um uh, and i think that will solve a, a a lot of a lot of the problems it's easier said yeah. than done uh, uh in terms of actually getting yeah scores. yeah i get uh, asked to re review uh, peer review some papers periodically i usually don't have the time and it always makes me think well if if i was a big name scientist in some field and i have a lab and i'm super busy and i got grad students and then i got a family at home and so on and and then the journal sends me yeah. some article I feel I should do it, but, you know, I'm going to give this 10 minutes or, you know, an hour or yeah, something right. like that. Exactly. And so you often find that, uh, you know, big name PIs will will give these tasks to their grad students, for instance, and uh, which is, you know, part of the training in some in some respect. But it's also sometimes abused mm. in the case that, you know, you just get your, your PhD student to do all the all the reviewing. And of course, you're never trained in how to review right. articles. No one ever tells you what to do. You're just given the article and told, you know, write a, write a review on it. So um, I think, yeah, some some sort of more formal training there. And I think part of this whole open science movement thing, which we're, we're kind of going through in science now, is making these things, making people more aware of these problems. Yeah. Um, uh, and so that one about, you know, peer review being everyone being in a rush and uh, you know what can what can we do about that what's the best what's the best outcome uh, um what's the best solution to that and um and just making people aware of the problems in general make i think i think and that's probably what partly the reason for writing this book is to is to cause more yeah, of this debate yeah. and have more of this discussion i think the fear of being the next you know disastrous replication failure or you know fi someone finding a typo that ruins all the results in your experiment i think that should be part at least yeah, of the motivation yeah, yeah. to get yeah. if right. i don't find the errors in my research th these other guys over here that now do this for a living Someone they're going to figure yeah. it out yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly and i don't want to be on that uh, list you have the list of the uh retraction list and uh you know like oh, yeah. there's the top 10 uh, people on the list that's i don't want to be on that list <laughs> Yeah, the retraction watch leaderboard. It's like the, I think I say in the book, it's like the reverse Nobel Prize. It's like the people who've had the most papers retracted for, and in, in, in all the top 10 cases, it's fraud. I mean, obviously retractions don't, don't, uh, don't always indicate fraud. It could just be a mistake you made or, um, uh, you know, some, some sort of other issue. But, um, and, and a lot of scientists now are saying, 
honestly putting their hands up and saying, look, I made a mistake, retract the paper. Um, but um, in those cases where it's like 50, 60, 100 papers retracted, yeah. it's fraud. And <laughs> right. uh, you don't want to be on that yeah. list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like your discussion of how do you, how do you, how can you tell if somebody has fraudulently, you know, faked their data? And it's usually that because it goes in one direction. Whereas, you know, if it's just messy, the errors are going to be kind of scatter shot all over the place. And this reminded me of um, uh, uh, David Irving, the you know the British Holocaust denier. Uh, in his trial, mm. you know, he sued Deborah Lipstadt for calling him a Holocaust denier. Okay, and in England, he uh, it was the burden was on her to prove that she didn't libel him, and mm. reverse it the way it is in America. And so uh, she hired a team of crack uh, World War II historians or historians of the Second World War, Richard Evans in particular. And so he went through everything he and his graduate students or whoever you know went through everything David sure, Irving sure. ever wrote, checked every footnote, and so on. Now, if you did that with anybody, you're going to find errors. But what they found was every error goes in this one direction of kind of exonerating yeah. the Nazis. Hitler didn't know and so right. on and so on. Right. Whereas, you know, yeah. you, you do this to somebody else, it's going to be the errors are all over the place. And that's kind of what happened, I, th and you I see think, this. with uh, David Baltimore. Remember that case where, you know, uh, he was the AIDS, HIV AIDS researcher in the 80s. Ah, yes, and he right. got accused of uh, fraud and a big investigation ended up exonerating him showing that all labs that do biomedical research it's very complicated it's messy the data sets are all over the place and if you really yeah. pick through anybody's data set you're going to find errors and his errors were just kind of scattershot no, in no direction so he ended up being exonerated well i think it doesn't necessarily even show fraud if the if the if the errors all go in one direction it can yeah, just be biased right, yeah, as well right, like so yeah. there's this the stat check thing that i talk about in my uh, in my book um which is this algorithm where it goes through it goes through papers and just checks whether the 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 statistics are correct or not so there's um there's uh, certain statistics that are based that are like um if, if you if you've written down two numbers the third one kind of has to be one mm. particular number and if it's something else then you've made mm. a mistake uh because they're, they're kind of dependent on each other um and so um what they found is i mean it's, it's some terrifying amounts of of errors in the psychological literature again mm. uh in, in in some of the top journals in psychology really scary amounts of errors and some you know a, a substantial minority of them were that the error would have flipped around the results of the, the paper and it would have actually got the opposite conclusion wow. than it than it than it got um, in some, in some, uh, you know, large, large um, too large, not large, but too large uh, uh, number of cases. But what they found was that the errors were not random. The errors tended where there were errors made, they tended to make the results look more significant, more statistically significant, mm. more uh, uh, in favor of the author's hypothesis. Um, and so that's probably some kind of mechanism whereby the authors are, um, if you get a result that isn't significant for your theory, you'll just go and check, and you'll just go and have a little extra look at that, and just make sure that's right. Whereas and, and that's where you discover that it was actually a mistake. Um, whereas if, if it's in favor of your theory, huh, let it by. No problem. Let, that's great. We'll write that <laughs> mm -hmm. one up. You know? and, so, and, that's, and that can be completely unconscious. But it just shows you know, scientists are human just like anyone else, and they're making these mistakes. It's just we need better mechanisms to yeah. catch them. And, they, and they have egos. They like status and recognition like anybody else in any other field. And th uh, so your point is that the system is set up in a way to drive scientists in these directions of not just fraud, but, but bias unconscious bias or whatever they're not they're trying to do the right thing but the whole system is set up to push them in this direction if they want to be successful yeah yeah absolutely and the, the system of uh promotion you know i mentioned tenure just getting papers published and so on um uh and and, and you know that's why you find scientists are sort of obsessed with not just finding things out about the world which is what you you think and what a lot of them say they got into the yeah right. the, you know the job for um, but they become obsessed with publishing yeah. papers. You know, where, where's your next paper, your next journal article, and then and then it gets to kind of some of the absurd uh, uh, stories that I have in the in the in the in, in the book of people. You know, it's salami slicing. So you know, you do an experiment and then you 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 write it up in five papers instead mm -hmm. of one to make it you know to just make it go a little bit further, like dilute each paper down, make it go a little bit further. Um, uh, cases where people are so obsessed with getting cited. Uh, um, because of course that looks good on your CV as well. If you can say I've, you know, this paper has been cited 500 times that in the real extreme cases, they, um, they form citation rings with other scientists and promise that they will always cite five mm. papers from, mm. you know, if you cite five papers from me, I'll cite five papers from you in my next paper. And they, they, they form these kind of cartels where they, where they all cite each other. Um, uh, and you know, entire journals have been, you know, uh, uh, loads of papers retracted, entire issues retracted because they were discovered that the, the journal editor 
was you know involved in some kind of citation right. cartel where they were trying to boost the, the the prestige of their journal by this other this other editor will will make sure that he cites your journal an <laughs> awful lot and and a huge amount of that comes down to you know this obsession with kind of metrics yeah. we have so we have personal metrics like the h index which is like how many articles do you have that were cited this number of times um uh, uh and and for journals the impact factor which is the average number of citations that a, an article published in the last two years mm. in the journal uh, uh, uh oh an article published in the journal would get in the last two years um and and we just look at those numbers and those were supposed to be numbers i mean the the the, the impact factor was supposed to be a number that helped librarians choose which journals to uh to subscribe to because they've got limited resources and, and and so on but it's become like the number that yeah. tells you the prestige and the quality of right. a journal, which is never what it was intended to do. But we know, as you say, everyone's busy. Everyone's, you know, got loads of other stuff to do. And so they use these as heuristics, these numbers, um, and they become obsessed with getting into nature, which has an impact factor of 44 or whatever it was uh, when I last looked. Um, and not so much other journals, which have, you know, maybe an impact factor of something like one <laughs> right. or, or something like that. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, and and um, there are big there are big problems with using these 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 as averages because they're from a really skewed distribution. There's some papers that get a huge amount of the citations. It's like the income distribution. Right. The power some law. people get a huge number of the citations. Exactly. And then there's a lot of papers that hardly anyone yeah. ever looks at, and, and in some cases, no one yeah, ever cites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You talked about the Google H index, or Google Scholar H index. You know, of course, everybody yeah, checks. Yeah, yeah. So I went and checked mine because I hadn't really even thought about it because I don't really do that kind of yeah. research anyway. Mine was 28. I, I like that. I don't know if that's any good or not. Not bad. <laughs> not bad. Not pretty, that's pretty impressive. So that means you have 28 articles which have each been cited 28 okay. times. Uh, right. at least. I see. I see. Yeah. But in a way, I don't want. I, I don't want to be checking that because then I'm going to, you know, try to do something maybe I don't actually want to do. So it's so, sort of like, you know, a baseball player. Well, how do I be successful? Well, here are the metrics we use to judge you. Okay, then I'm going to go do those. <laughs> right. Right. Rather than rather than saying what you should be saying to yourself is, you know, the reason that the reason that that number like it's like the letter versus the spirit of the law. The reason that that number is there, the spirit of that number is that good research gets cited more. And so you want to do good right. research. But instead, they're cutting out the good research bit. <laughs> and they're just saying cited. more. Right. And so you see people doing massive self citation, um, you know, filling up their articles with with uh, all you know references to all their previous their previous work, which is, you know, understandable to some extent because people build lines of research right. and that's totally fine you can you, you know, you've got to cite maybe five or six of your previous papers if you're building up a theory it makes sense but if you're citing like if 80 percent of the citations in in the in the um in your reference section are to yourself uh, maybe you're thinking more about your your age yeah, index yeah, rather yeah, than you yeah. get right oh yeah you mentioned um, self plagiarization which is a weird concept and that too yeah uh yeah how can you plagiarize yourself they're my words my thoughts mm -hmm. well um, you know, now that I'm older and I've written a lot, I find myself think, well, uh, I'm about to write something. I think, I think I already wrote something about this and I'll find it. And I'll think, <laughs> okay, I got to rewrite this, but I really like the way I said it. So sometimes I just rewrite it. Mm -hmm. and sometimes I'll say, well, here's how I put it in 2003 in this book or whatever. Right. And I got right. that from R Richard Dawkins because he's even older than me. He's written even more than me. And he's really good about this. He'll, he'll actually just indent the text of what he wrote back in such and such. And that's legitimate. But th there was that yeah, case no, of, of the, I forget his name now, the science writer that got, um, he, he misquoted or made up quotes from Bob Dylan, and he, and he got torpedoed. Oh, uh, John Lehrer. Lehrer. And he got, a, th when this came out, uh, that he was self-plagiarizing, I thought, well, what? Well, he was getting paid <laughs> by one very popular journal yeah. to write something original, and he would just kind of recycle something from another big, because these are well-paying, big-name journals, you, you can't really get away with that. But if you're doing it in some obscure journal, probably no one would notice. Well, no one notices until, and the, the, the problem is that until they do notice, and it's a bit like fraud, where where when you find one article that's been self-plagiarized, right. and then you look at a pair, someone's the rest of their work, and you find, oh my God, this this is all you know, right. a patchwork of bits from previous right. papers, and 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 again, it it, it creates, uh, you know, aside from it being you know um, dishonest in terms of the you know the, the the editor of the journal, you're telling them when you submit the paper that this is a new bit of writing mm -hmm. or a new bit of research. Um, Apart from it being dishonest, there it creates a, a, a sort of um, a, you know it's, it, it moves the, the the playing fields to be you know um, to to not be level anymore between different researchers. We're all comparing each other on the basis of our like citation counts right, and CVs right. and all that sort of stuff. And there's someone with a massive CV, but it's because they self plagiarized uh, a huge amount. And there's you know I I, I won't say the the name, but the, there's a UK case now where there's a massively um, 
massively cited scientist uh, uh, who has endless papers, publishes probably a paper every single day. Um, and uh, sure enough, someone has discovered that there's vast amounts of what looks like self-plagiarism mm. in, in, in that work, reusing the text over and over again from previous papers. Um, and, and you know, so it's, it's uh, you might ask, it's probably not as bad a, a thing as stealing other people's work, but it's, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it, and it, it does always seem to be something that people do a huge amount of. And it's the same with fraud. Like you discover that someone has photoshopped a picture, a, a, you know, a microscope right. photo in one of their papers. And then you know, there's empirical evidence for this that, you know, you go into their other papers and you find it's been done loads of times there yeah. as well. People somehow can't resist it. It's like it's a personality right. trait, like being dishonest, right. you know, it, make, it makes sense. Like <laughs> um, personality is a thing. Yeah. The photograph examples you give in the book, that's just hard to believe that somebody would try to get away with it. That's pretty risky. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's just it's hiding in plain sight, uh, and um, you know you have these. I, I mentioned a case that was in the 1960s where people had used the kind of rudimentary uh, photo editing mm -hmm. tools, you know, back then, and managed to get it into science an article. Um, um, but nowadays, it's so much easier to do it with right, Photoshop right. And, and and so on. So one of the people to look up in this in this case is um, so uh, Elizabeth Bick, who is a, a microbiologist, and uh, she's now I, I think she now her title is a um, like a scientific integrity consultant. So she does kind of investigations <clears throat> excuse me just investigations of people's um uh of all these um of, of journals you know they look through journals and you look through the people's work and, and the photos and she has this amazing eye for spotting one part of a photo that's mm. identical to another mm. part of a photo um, and she does these kind of challenges on twitter where she'll put up you know several different photos which you know to your eye look yeah. like they're kind of right. random you know right. just, just pictures of cells or whatever it is or, or blots um, but she has, you know, and maybe, in, in, you know, later on, she'll she'll tweet another one showing that actually this part is identical right. to this part and this part is identical Isn't to this part. Isn't there something like if you, and, if and you rotate has, the photograph upside down, it, it, it it's hard to see that it's the same one as the other one that's right side up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so people, again, it's like it's like um, it's like fraudsters uh, making data that doesn't look realistic. They can also make photos that don't look realistic. But fraudsters that are a bit wiser to it that are the more kind of perfect yeah. crime type people that are, that are the, the the smarter ones that are less likely to get caught are the ones that are thinking oh, how do i make this picture look realistic how do i make this data set look like it actually was you know it came from reality rather than my right. mind yeah. yeah well i want to wrap things up here uh Stuart, i know you're busy but uh sure. i love the example you, you you provide in the book about steve gould because i knew steve he was a good friend and, uh, and of course i read his mismeasure man book and loved it and all this mm -hmm. stuff about bias and science that he called our attention to back in the late 70s and 80s was really important but then you know the the morton skull thing that he wrote about where yeah. morton uh, supposedly had this bias to show that black skulls were smaller than white skulls and so on with indians in between and whatnot <laughs> Uh, and then that kind of got debunked, but then that the debunking got debunked. <laughs> this was like 2011 and 2015, yeah. so it's fairly recent, and he's long That's gone right. to, to to not be able to, to defend himself. But it shows you that how complicated it is, even with something relatively simple, like it's just the skull, fill it up with something. Yeah. Well, what do you fill it up with? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. that may make a difference. Yeah, yeah. And then how do you interpret yeah, it? Yeah, so the, there was the lead shot. Right. Versus the versus the right. seeds and uh, and then these days actually I think the technique hasn't changed that much these days they use like um you know little balls of silicone mm. or whatever it is that that, that that kind of fill up the skull that's how the, that's the modern right. way of doing it um and so yeah the the criticism of Gould has been criticised itself and then there was there's there's four or five papers all of which are, are discussed and cited in the book is um uh, that that kind of go through all the reasons for it and my 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 understanding is the my, our current our current state and this could change is that Morton made some mistakes. Um, but Gould exaggerated right. those mistakes, um, and uh, and and also had his own also had his own biases. But the kind of meta point, if you want to actually, and, and you know, that's all very interesting for bias in science. And Gould was absolutely right that people are trying to make a clean story and all the stuff we've talked about already. Um, he he kind of he was talking about this stuff in the 1970s. You know, uh, um, re really 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 great discussion of it. But the meta point is that if you actually want to understand reality, these are just samples of skulls that this guy had collected. They're not actually a representative right. sample of people from these places, right? right? Like, so you can't actually learn too much no. about the reality of if there are any skull differences from this. But it is instructive in in a kind of meta scientific sense about how you know you still when someone uh, comes up with a this debunking of a of a scientific idea, you still got to check their debunking, right. and you've still got to be skeptical of the skeptics in, in in that sense. And that's part of the whole scientific process is being rigorously, you know disinterested and skeptical all the time and that's these 
um, these kind of norms of science that I describe in the book of being of this process of organized skepticism constantly happening to everything and never, never stopping and saying that is the final, that is the final yeah. answer. Well, when you put things like, you know, racial differences between, between these groups, racial differences in say intelligence or athletic ability or whatever, that's been supercharged since the sixties, you know, and then gender differences in cognitive abilities that was, uh, that got super controversial in the early 2000s. And now we're going through this like gender dysphoria and transsexual research. Mm -hmm. And these, you know, the studies are coming out like every week. It's like, ooh, what should we think? What should we think? And of course, people are divided on this. And the the, the facts don't just speak for themselves. You really got to dig into how the study was actually done. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think a lot of the um, the uh, the reforms that I talked about, like things like pre-registration, being open with data, being transparent and so on, can really can help to some extent take the heat out of these of these uh, issues. I mean, obviously, these are just hot yeah. button, massively controversial yeah, areas. But I think if people were much more open and transparent about how they go into doing their studies and, you know, saying this is their hypothesis beforehand and, 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 and so on, um, you can, I think, you can make your studies more convincing. Basically, my 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 uh, my message to scientists is: there are simple things you can do that would make your studies look more convincing to people, um, rather than putting the study out there and then people can criticize it on the basis that you've not been transparent, that you've you may have come up with these uh, analyses on the fly, yeah. um, that you're not sharing your data, that there's all these errors in your studies. So I think um, some of the open science stuff can really be helpful here. Although you know, it would be naive to suggest that it's going to solve any yeah. of these, you know, massive uh, hotline well, I always, issues. I often do wonder why scientists are interested in certain topics like that. Like, you know, why do you want to know if there are black white differences in intelligence? What, what you know, what, what, this is so controversial, but why, why do you want to know? And uh, yeah, no, exactly. And I think, I think there is a kind of, um, there's a glee that some scientists have when they discuss, they're not scientists necessarily, or some definitely have been some scientists in the past, but also lots of kind of activists online and who are mm -hmm, jumping on this mm -hmm. stuff who are, you know, who, if there was a difference found, they would actually be pretty pleased and they, and they really like that idea. And so they, they, um, they, they talk about it in, in, in with this kind of, um, this kind of, uh, really perverse kind of enjoyment almost. And you can instantly see that that's not the sort of person you should be relying on for, for data or any right. kind of, you know, dispassionate Last analysis. year I went to this conference where this was part, part of the focus of the conference was, you know, group differences, both race and gender. And, and the, the mm. kind of underlying theme was we are objective scientists and we're being unfairly attacked because we just want to present the facts as they are. And, you know, the, the woke left doesn't want to know these facts because, their feelings trump the facts and so on. It's like, I don't know, you're, you're pushing this a little too hard here. Me, th me thinks yeah, you're exactly, too exactly. interested in this subject. It, it, you're not just right. like an astronomer counting the number of stars in a slide or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it becomes almost like a reactive thing. Like I'm saying something because it's controversial. So I'll, 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 I'll put it out there and it'll, you know, it'll be, uh, it'll, it'll get people, get people, uh, you know, it'll exercise them in some way or, or make them upset almost in some way. And yeah, you can, you can totally see that, um, uh, with, with, with all sorts of areas of research that are controversial, that, that people write papers knowing that they will yeah. get a, you know, a, a response like that. And, and actually in some sense reveling in that, in right. that which is not dispassionate no, science and no. not, you know, disinterested Boy, the, the science. The libtards in, in the are going to explode when they see my, my right, study. Right, exactly. Like, exactly. Uh, mm, I don't know. You get all the YouTube videos with like the capital letters in the title, <laughs> uh, this new study destroys the right, woke left right, or whatever happens to yeah. be, you know, it's like, that's not science right, either, yeah. you know, and there's not such a thing as like the science and then the woke left on the other side. That's right. just not, that's just not right. how it works. And we all need to be constantly thinking about our own biases. Yeah, totally. Well, Stuart, thanks for coming on the show. Congratulations on the new book. I, your book should be like assigned to every single undergraduate science student. You know, these, these, you know, these are really core Thank issues. You. So I, I don't know what it's going to take to get it out there. Uh, and but uh, it, where would you direct people to go online to to read more about this besides your book? Uh, this open this well, open science if, project. Yeah, if you look up open science, and um, there are websites like the um, the the Center for Open Science, which is uh, works out of uh, the University of Virginia, and um, they have loads of resources on their website of how to you know um, you know essentially change science. They have a they have a blog that updates on on all the kind of new things that they're doing. Their their big focus is on you know trying to make it easy for scientists to do this stuff. So there are lots of tools that are freely available on there, and you know on that website there are also loads of people's data and loads of people's uh, um, you know experimental plans and stuff. So you can see how it should look. 
Um, but also, I mean, I think I think one of the big places of for this discussion on open science has, has been has been Twitter, mm. has been social mm-hmm. media, mm-hmm. has been following people who are, you know, not only the people who are discovering the, the major problems in people's research, which also sometimes happens on Twitter. Sometimes someone will like put a thread saying, I think there might be something really weird about this data set and you can watch mm-hmm. that happen. Um, but also people saying, I've got a new tool. Uh, this is a really good way to annotate your your code or this is a really good way to share your data with other people and um, this is a really good new idea that a journal could use to make its research more reliable and um, so i think just following this general open science discussion on twitter is a, is a, is a great thing and, and can kind of open your mind to okay it's not just that we just accept what's in the journals we need to constantly yeah. be, be be questioning your twitter that. handle um, and social media and um, i'm Stuart j ritchie on twitter okay. just all on all, all, all right Street. and you're not directing people to send bitcoins anywhere <laughs> <laughs> i don't have a blue tick so i wasn't hacked. Uh, that's too funny yeah very good and so what's the next big project for you uh well i think now that this book is done i want to focus on on doing more like standard mm-hmm. scientific stuff uh, uh which is you know my interest is is in uh cognitive abilities kind of uh um cognitive aging and um and i'm in a kind of psychiatry center now at king's college london um so i want to kind of work more on the intersection of um cognitive processes and mental health so that's my kind of where i'm kind of aiming for but i want to do it in this open way i want to make sure that um everything is being read pre-registered data is being shared codes being shared as much as possible so i'm going to try and model uh, a good good research practice for good. this area. You gotta, you gotta figure out this cognitive decline thing because I'm 65 now. So you That's got <laughs> you got 15 years to figure it out before before we baby boomers hit the wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, God. All right, okay, I better get back to that. <laughs> All right, Stuart. Thanks again. I love the book. Love Congratulations. All right, thanks for having Bye-bye. me on. Cheers.